topics, right? We've got slats and igniters. Now, when we use the term untangling igniters, we're not actually untangling igniters. Uh, it's just more of a metaphor for revealing some of the mystery of igniters. Not that there's too much mystery, but we're going to answer any questions around igniters, uh, all kinds of things. So basically, those are pretty much our two main topics. And while they're different, they actually relate in many ways. And we're going to be getting into some of those details as we progress. And I'm going to be your primary host today. So you're kind of stuck with me for probably the next hour here. Okay, so today we are going to be, again, two, two, two main topics. Slats is the, uh, the first one. We're gonna talk about what is a slat, right? So let's get, we'll get into the basics of, of a slat. We're gonna talk about the types of slats, right? So what different types of slats does Cobra offer? We're gonna talk about uh, why and why not use slats. And I think, and I'm gonna cover this later, but most importantly, Slats are great, but there's also reasons in which slats aren't so great. So the goal here today is not just cover the great things about slats, but also the not so great things about slats when they're uh, so that we're, and again, because we're not really trying to sell you slats here, we're just trying to figure out, you know, whether or not slats are important for you or not important for you. We're going to be covering parallel and series, which was already asked earlier. So we're definitely going to dig into the details of, of what that means and a couple of additional topics within slats, some more advanced items, such as hybrid wiring, things like that, which we'll be covering in our webinar. The second primary topic is Talon and MJG igniter. So what is a Talon clip-on igniter? What is an MJG firewire initiator? Or I'll probably refer to it as uh, just kind of like an MJG igniter throughout this presentation, because that's a mouthful to say. And we're going to talk about the pros and cons, and, and not even so much pros and cons, but when do you, what, what's, you know, what are the applications of talent igniters and what are the applications of MGG igniters? Great, so let's dive right into slat. So what is a slat? So you'll notice on my, I'm going to be using this area here for a lot of the presentation today. So let's talk specifically about what is a slat, right? So a slat is effectively, it's basically a dumb PCB board. So commonly we get the question of, well, if I add a slat to my module, will that increase the total number of cues that I can fire? And the answer to that is, is really no. Like it's not gonna allow you to fire additional unique cues. So for example, you can't turn an 18M into a 36M by purchasing a slat. Um, however, the slat will fire at the exact same time as the module, right? And so as we get into cables a bit, you'll obviously have to connect the slat to a module somehow. And with Cobra and most systems, that's done using a cable. So whenever a slat is connected via a cable directly to a module, the slat will always fire at the exact same time as the module. So you kind of have to think about a slat as like a dumb mirrored position to the module, right? That'll always fire at the same time, but it doesn't actually add any additional unique cues. With all the slats that we sell, uh, we do offer a full two millimeter thickness. And while that doesn't seem like that's very thick in the world of PCB boards, that is actually a fairly thick PCB board. So if you notice, I'll rotate this to the side. And if I actually try to bend this slat, you know, this doesn't just bend very easily. So I really, really have to work at that to get some flex out of this. I'm, I am giving it a fairly decent amount of force. And so the slat, while it is a circuit board and it may feel a little bit, uh, you know, perhaps, um, you know, not so strong, it is actually quite strong. So it can take quite a beating and it is fairly thick. Uh, you'll also notice on the slat itself, there's certain elements, like for example, around these mounting holes, it looks kind of gold. Uh, in addition to that, within any of our speaker terminals here, and you won't be able to really see it from my webcam, but we actually have a gold-plated trace uh, within all of our slats. And what that does is that gold plating within the contacts within the speaker terminals or in other areas of the slat, it really just gives you a little bit better uh, connectivity and also prevention against corrosion long-term. So, you know, if you do get moisture buildup due, you know, it's not 
uncommon within a shoot site for after the shoot site for you to kind of like wipe water off of surfaces. That gold plating will just ultimately provide a little bit of corrosive, corrosion resistance long term within our slats. Okay, and we also do offer a variety of different protective accessories to slats uh, that you can find on our website, including backings and also aluminum covers. So with Cobra, we do have a variety of slat sizes. We have both mini and regular size options. I uh, unfortunately didn't actually bring any of the regular sized options, but I do have both the mini version of the 18 and the 36Q slat available. Uh, if you do purchase our regular size versions, think of those kind of as like a jumbo size, okay? So these speaker terminals on the minis, they're not as small as what you would normally see on an 18M. They're actually quite larger. So they're actually a very comfortable size to use, um, even if you have big fingers. If you go with the regular sized option, especially for these onboard cues, they are much larger. Um, and I, again, I would kind of consider those a jumbo version. So our slats may be better labeled regular size and jumbo versus mini and regular, but that's just kind of how they're called today. And we also have the availability of not just onboard Q slats, which is, what, which is what you're seeing here, but we also have the availability of quick plug slats. So this is actually the equivalent of an 18Q quick plug slat, which we'll go into a little bit later. And this is a 36Q quick plug slat that you'll see right here. Now, slats can also be connected together with multiple slats, which we're gonna cover later on. So the idea is that if you did have multiple slats, you can actually connect to those together with multiple cables back to the same module. So you may have, for example, a module and a cable coming out of that to a slat with another cable to another slat, et cetera. And by doing that, all of the slats that are connected back to that single module are all gonna fire at the exact same time. So again, with slats, you can have more than just one mirrored position, you can have multiple mirrored positions. Now, slats can also be in series or parallel. Now, don't worry about those terms right now. We're gonna cover those a little bit later and what that means, but essentially it's a, a type of a wiring technique that's normally used when you're placing multiple igniters into a queue. And the slats will just emulate that wiring technique. Uh, within the actual traces in the board. And again, we'll cover that later on within this webinar. Excellent. So let's talk about the different types of slats that Cobra offers. Now we have, <laughs> if you didn't catch Mr. Sparkle, he's kind of hiding there with his head poking out our success slat. And uh, so let's go ahead and show you some of these slats that we offer. And I'm looking furiously around for one of them, which is right here. So we'll start off with our 6Q slats. So this right here is the, um, this is the 6Q speaker terminal slat. This is the 6Q quick plug slat. Now these slats actually use an RJ45 connector, uh, otherwise known as commonly like a Cat5, Cat6, or even a Cat7 cable. And those are cables that you can actually purchase uh, commonly online. Uh, they do come in different gauges so that we're gonna cover a little bit later on as we talk more about cables. But these are specifically, this is the 6Q slat. You can kind of get a sense of its size just looking at my hands. You know, same thing with the uh, quick plug slats. You know, these are quite small, it's pretty cool. Uh, and also with these types of slats, you can, especially with your 18M, you can actually upgrade your 18M if you're not using slats today to support both uh, you know, slats that you can connect into these little 6Q slats, as well as the 18Q slats, which I'm covering in a little bit. Now we also have 18Q slats, and so that's these guys right here. The 18Q slats are essentially the same as a 6Q slat, but with, with uh, more Qs, right? And the big difference is that on the 18Q slats, instead of using an RJ45 connector that we were using in the 6Q slats, we're using a DB25 connector, right? If, if you're not familiar with DB25, it's basically the old printer ports, right? So if you weren't, you know, if you had computers back in the kind of in the 90s, maybe late 80s uh, or more, you know, these are a traditional printer port, uh, individual pins. 
and uh, these slats have, have connectors on both sides. And, and same thing over here on both sides. And some of our slats actually have three connectors, and that's mainly for the parallel slats, which we'll get to. So these are our 18Q slats, again, quick plugs and onboard cues. And then last but not least, we've got our 36Q slats, right? So in this case, we've got a total of 36Qs. Uh, again, very similar to the others, just more Qs. And with the 36Q slats, we actually use a different type of connector. In this case, this is referred to as a Centronix uh, 50 pin connector, right? A little bit different. Centronix connectors do not have like these little individual pins that, that go into it. There's more, there are more of these kind of flush contacts that work together, but it's a pretty cool connector. I actually like it a lot uh, because it's got a nice flush fit and it has these little, what we refer to as bail locks. So when we get into uh, cables, we'll show how these snap in together, but they're kind of a cool connector. I like them a lot. Anyway, those are the Centronix, Centronix connectors. So again, 36 Q slots, both in the quick plug form and also within the onboard Q speaker terminal form. And again, speaker terminals available. These are the minis. They also have them in, uh, in the regular size as well as parallel and series, which we'll cover here shortly. Any questions so far, panelists? Are we looking good? Or anything specific to this? Or should I keep going? Keep going, yeah, nothing um, for this. Uh, we've got a, well, I don't know if Joel has anything, but we've got an RJ45 life question, but that can be answered yeah. shortly. Okay. All right, so let's talk a little bit about cables. So we've got a lot of cables that Cobra sells. Now, we'll focus specifically on the, uh, we'll just talk right now about the, we'll kind of grab this here, so bear with me. These are the DB25 cables, and let's talk a bit about 24 versus 22 gauge. So if you go to our website, you'll notice that we have the ability for when you're purchasing a cable to get either a 22 or 24 gauge cable. Uh, the 22 gauge cable, which is here on the left, uh, is essentially the heavy duty cable. The one on the right here is the 24 gauge light duty cable. Now, one thing to note is that when you hear heavy duty and you hear light duty, your initial assumption is that this 22 gauge cable here on the left is a higher quality cable and may last longer, right? Because it's quote heavy duty. And while there, there is a bit of that to it because the, uh, the actual gauge of the wire is a little thicker as a lower gauge, the actual connectors on the end, if I were to show these to you, um, they're actually not much different, right? The strain relief is exactly the same. The size is the same. These knob screws for tightening is exactly the same. The only difference that you're gonna kind of see here is that, that the thickness of this cable, we can kind of see that, the thickness of this cable, which is the 22 gauge, is a little thicker than the one on the right hand side here, okay? And that thickness, if you have a lower gauge, such as 22, it's a thicker caber, cab, cab, caber, <laughs> cable, a higher gauge is, is a thinner cable, and the primary difference is resistance and cost, okay? So a thicker gauge is actually a much higher cost, and, and, it's, and we'll talk a bit about cheaper cables here in a second, but you'd be amazed as that gauge goes down how much more expensive these cables actually can become. Uh, but if you were to take, for example, uh, and I believe this is a five meter cable for 22 gauge, and this is a five meter cable for 24 gauge, the 24 gauge version of the five meter cable has the same amount of resistance, right, as, uh, you get this right, as uh, half, essentially half of its size for a 22 gauge cable, meaning, if I had this as a five meter 22 gauge cable and I had uh, essentially the, uh, the five meter 24 gauge cable has the same amount of resistance as a 10 meter 22 gauge cable. So as you go from 22 to 24 gauge, the resistance actually um, essentially increases, right? And what does that mean? Well, it basically means that you can fire less, a less maximum number of igniters on a lighter, uh, duty cable or a higher gauge cable, right? So the lighter duty is a higher gauge, right? And, you know, one of the things that 
we talk about is if you go to different websites, for example, Monoprice or other sites that are out there, you can find these cables and you'll find that they're actually very inexpensive. And the reason for that is because their gauge is oftentimes a 28 or a 30 gauge cable. So while you may purchase a 100 foot cable online thinking, hey, that's great, I just bought a 100 foot cable for 30 bucks, right? That 100 foot 30 gauge cable is effectively the same as about a 600 foot 22 gauge cable, right? And over 600 feet, there's only so many igniters that you can fire in maximum. So while you may think, hey, this is great, I'll, I'll create you know, three slats, 100 feet per slat, connect that back to the module, you know, look at our specifications, say, hey, I'm good to go, I can fire an igniter or, or more on all three of those positions. What you don't realize is that you're actually running effectively 1,800 feet of a 22 gauge gable, and you're going to have problems. Igniters aren't going to fire, and you're going to wonder why. Why? Okay. And we'll talk uh, about those maximums a little bit later within this presentation, and some of the techniques that we can recommend to ensure that whatever you're choosing, as far as uh, cable types, power source, uh, types of slats, uh, that, that you know you'll have a good shoot, and that everything's going to fire according to what you want. But do beware of the online cheap cables. We are not just gouging you on these cables. You'd be surprised. These are probably one of our lower margin items just because it is expensive to get lower gauge cables. And they're also aluminum shielded, stranded, uh, copper. So this, you know, they're just a really, really nice cable. All right, so the difference between DB25 and the Centronics 50 pin, uh, we already kind of covered this a bit. I'll show this briefly. You can see here that these are just simply two different types of connectors. One has pins on it, one doesn't. It uses more of these contacts. You'll also notice uh, these are two heavy duty ca gauge cables compared. You'll see here, if you can kind of see it, maybe not. Uh, maybe look at this over here. You'll see the thickness of that Centronics. Uh, connector right here is much, much, much thicker. So don't underestimate the thickness of these cables. They're quite bulky and heavy. Uh, the strain relief on all of our cables is quite nice, uh, you know, compared to a lot of cables you can purchase in the market, you know, including other firing systems. I, I do think the Cobra offers a very high quality cable. So, you know, really nice strain relief, really nice molding. Uh, and also with cables, we do recommend that you're storing them you know, with kind of within a dry climate controlled environment. Also, they're kind of like a garden hose, right? When you're wrapping these guys up, you know, especially if you're in a cold weather environment, you just want to make sure that you're not forcing these cables to bend in a way that doesn't feel natural. So if they're kind of coiling up naturally, that's great, uh, you know, because over time, you know, you want to make sure you maintain these well, because, you know, over the years, you, you could cause things to break, even though these are a nice cable that we do so. Excellent. So we're going to switch off of cables for a moment here. Um, actually, you know what? I am going to go back very briefly and I'm going to show you a couple different things. Uh, when you do go to our website, you will see that we offer uh, a whole variety of different types of cables, you know, including uh, these are little eight inch right angle two straight adapters, right? So these are great if you get a straight to straight cable, if your cables have the straight extension, if you want to convert them to right angle to fit on your module. We do offer these at a fairly inexpensive price. And the other cool thing as I go through my bag of goodies here, so just kind of bear with me, a bunch of things. We also offer female to female adapters. So for example, if you did have two, you know, DB25 cables and you wanted to connect those cables together in order to create a longer cable, you can use this DB25 female to female adapter those, uh, that adapter just simply plugs right into the cable, such as this, right? And then you can take another cable and you can plug this in here, right? And then you can screw these in to hold them together. But by doing this, this allows you to extend the length of the cable. And we offer this female to female adapter in both the 18Q version, as well as the uh, 50Q, uh, I'm sorry, not 50Q, the Centronics 50 pin cable for the uh, 36 Q slats, and I'm sure in time we'll have for the same thing for the RJ45 connector. And these are a couple fun things that you'll see coming soon. This is actually a Centronics 50 to uh, RJ45 adapter. So if you're using 6 Q slats, 
Uh, this is a great cable. These are all labeled, which is pretty cool. And it's just a really nice, high quality, uh, essentially kind of a breakout cable. And we have this both for the Centronics uh, 36, the Centronics 50 and the DB25. Uh, they, they will be on our website very shortly here. But if you're interested, let us know. And I think that's it with cables. We will be covering shunts here sh shortly later on. So if I'm not covering shunts right now, don't worry. I'm going to get to that in a second. All right, any uh, little break here? Anything, anything from the panelists? And hold on, we may have a drink moment here. There we go. And there's a cat. So that's your drink moment. He's a very fat cat. Okay, very good, guys. All right, what type of socks am I wearing? Great question. All right, so we'll- I haven't seen them appear yet, so I figured this would be an appropriate time for people to guess. That's true, all right, okay. So there's two slides here. We're gonna talk about why people use slats and also why people don't use slats. And again, I wanna, I'm gonna to continue to stress this throughout the presentation that this is not a sales pitch on slats. There's great things about slats, and there's also lots of things that aren't so great about slats. And you have to kind of consider both of those equal. So a couple of the nice things about slats is they do support the concept of pre-wiring, right? So it's very common for people to, you know, especially if you're doing pyramusicals where you have, you know, highly condensed fronts, uh, if you're using things such as like pyro llamas or other different types of racking systems for condensing comets and mines and other types of ground effects within a very small space. It's very common for those very tedious wiring high Q shows for people to pre-wire those effects uh, kind of directly into a slat, right? And so when you pre-wire into a slat, it gives you the opportunity to do that without connecting those E-matches or igniters into a firing module that you feel is potentially a risk because A, the module may have power, right? B, the module is not shunted, right? So by using pre-wiring, you can wire into your slat, you can shunt the slat, which further protects it from ESD, from you know, unintention or, excuse me, yeah, unintentionally firing any igniters, uh, which we'll cover later. And uh, so pre-wiring can be done on you know, uh, you know, onboard cue slats, it can be done with quick plug slats, and with all the slats that we do sell, you will see that we have, you know, mounting holes on them. Um, also, some of our protective accessory also have mounting holes, so you can kind of pre-mount these to various things and pre-wire into them and connect them to your, to your module on the day of the uh, shoot site. All right, so what types of socks is Scott wearing? <laughs> Uh, right, I am not wearing thigh highs, I can assure you of that. And I wish I, I actually do own USA flag socks, but I am, I'm actually sitting on the ground right now, this is on the table. So these are my socks, and I am wearing lobster, shrimp, and starfish socks. So for the 15% that voted for these, you are correct. All right. <laughs> what did they win? Oh, they, they got, uh, I'm about to, uh, I'm turning on smell -o vision on my camera, so take a big, deep whiff, and yep, you just won the smell of my feet in a beachfront property. Right, oh, and I forgot to mention that uh, I did order, uh, I think Long John Silver, if you're into Long John Silver fish, your DoorDash will be there in the next, uh, should be there in the next five minutes. So DoorDash will be arriving shortly for all of our webinar participants. Uh, that is included in your free ticket to our webinar. So enjoy. Okay, uh, with slats, the slats can also be less expensive than firing multiple modules at the same time. And this is like probably the most common reason that people buy slats is that they are, you know, and which is a great thing, right? You want to save money. Is if you're firing multiple positions at the same time, like we talked about right in the beginning of this webinar. By using slats, it's cheaper to often run cables and slats back to a single module than putting multiple uh, than putting modules separately on each position, right? However, there's like a ton of downsides to that, which we'll get into. <laughs> but but if you are planning on firing all of your module, all your positions at the same time, it, it can definitely uh, save you money, which is great. 
Uh, slats are also helpful, and this is more of a professional type feature for challenging signal situations, right? So if you're on a, like a lot of times in the special effects world, if you've got your pyro and it needs to be wired into something, and you know, if you were to put the module in the same position where you're wiring your, your, your pyro, uh, you know, you may not have great signal, like if it's in the trunk of a car, or I'm not sure. There's all kinds of different examples of that. Um, but using slats, you can run really, really long cable runs and get your module into a better signal position uh, versus running like a sing, a sync, uh, messed this up earlier today, a signal <laughs> extension cable, uh, which, you know, long, long ex uh, signal extension cables will, will generate signal loss, whereas a slat can, you can run much longer cables and you can signal extension wires and, and bring that module into a position that, that, that you know, has good signal, right? So that's, that's another reason that people use slats. Um, oftentimes, you may have situations where a module may be destroyed. Well, it's a lot cheaper to destroy a slat than it is to destroy a module. You know, a little 18Q uh, quick plug slat, I'd much rather see that uh, get sacrificed than, than, a, than a brand new module. Uh, and also slats, you'll, you'll commonly see them used on larger Q count modules. So if you do own like a 72 Q module, you know, it, it's, it's often difficult to, especially if you're not uh, wiring a lot of like smaller ground effects like comets and mines and things like that. You know, if you are shooting a lot of aerial product and you're dealing with larger mortars, you know, it is very common um, and, and, and best practice to use slats with larger Q count modules because it really gives you the ability to spread those module, um, spread those slats out within your shoot site at further distances from your module and uh, versus trying to run a bunch of really long E matches to a single spot or, or using a lot of scab or shooting wire, uh, which can be more challenging. It's just easier to run, kind of distribute almost like an octopus arms coming out of that module to the different positions of your shoot site with larger Q count modules. And last but not least, uh, a lot of custom applications we see, customers that use trailers, you know, to mount their slots, slats to various uh, surfaces of trailers, you know, other types of portable uh, pyro mounting devices, you know, lots, lots of people love custom applications. They love taking our cables and, and, and cutting them up and, and, and building, you know, fun and interesting ways to make their, their shoot sites uh, easier to set up and easier to take down. All right, so uh, why do we not use slats? Well, this is a great question. So again, we're not trying to sell you anything, so in some ways I'm gonna try to sell you off of slats right now. So one of the challenges with slats is that it's quite difficult to calculate the number of igniters to fire, right? So if you think about, and we're gonna get into this later, Cobra offers so many different options in the form of modules, power options, types of cables that we've already discussed, uh, you know, as far as length, gauge, uh, different wiring techniques, such as series versus parallel, different types of igniters, talons, e-matches, MJG igniters, and even e-matches themselves have varying brands and different brands of e-match based on composition can sometimes require more current or more voltage depending upon that brand and where you're getting it. So there's just all these kind of factors that go into you know, calculating what's the total maximum number of igniters to fire. And we start introducing all of these slats and cables you know, in these varying lengths with these varying power options, different types of modules, wiring techniques, uh, and it's, it's not that it's impossible to calculate, but it just becomes a bit difficult to calculate, right? And so that's just kind of a downside of using slats. First, it's just saying, hey, I'm going to stick an 18M out there. I know that my 18M, I'm using LiPo, so it can fire eight E matches in parallel or 10 in series. And as long as I'm not using really long E matches, I can just stick to those specifications, you know, easy cheesy, right? Uh, you know, maintenance of cables and slats is a little challenging. You know, if you've ever been on a shoot site, it's no fun to have to uh, roll up a 86 foot, you know, heavy duty Centronics 50 pin cable. It's kind of a pain in the butt, especially if it's cold out and the wires aren't bending. Uh, and once you get them back, you may want to clean them. You know, if you're doing a lot of shoot sites, if you're a professional company, you're using these over and over and over, you know, as the years goes on, the, you know, the cables, you know, even the best cables will take damage and need and do require maintenance, right? So maintenance is, is certainly something to consider, uh, you know, versus just pure modules. 
Uh, modules can also be, or excuse me, slats can also be a little bit tricky to script with, right? So if you've got multiple positions, you know, for example, if you're using Cobra Show Crater, if you're using Finale, you know, you have to kind of go into those positions. You have to tell Finale that, hey, in this position, it's going to, we're going to override it. So it's going to use this channel because we want channel on position L1, L2, L3, and L4, and L5 to all be the same, you know, versus having Finale auto address those. And so when you start scripting and you start having mirrored channels across positions that can become a little bit more difficult and cumbersome, you know, versus just having every position and every uh, module have its own channel, which is always a lot easier. Continuity checks can oftentimes be a lot more difficult with slats. So for example, if you had a bunch of parallel slats and they were all wired back to the same module, well, when you're wiring in parallel, as we'll get into in a moment here, uh, you know, if you've got one e-match that's not connected, well, you may not know that it has bad continuity because you've got another slat on that same chain that does have good continuity, right? So oftentimes you may see people running around with like continuity checkers or a spare module. They're plugging in individual slats to check to see if they have continuity. And you have to do that locally right on the slat. You can't do that like right from your h 2 or from your control panel. So sometimes continuity checks can be a little bit more difficult, cumbersome when you're dealing with slats. And, you know, it's kind of obvious cables and slats kind of go against a bit, you know, not entirely, but a bit against the concept of a wireless system. You know, so regardless of whatever system you're using, in the case of Cobra, you know, having cables and slats, uh, you know, it's, it's wild, wired cable connections, right? And, you know, just something that you don't necessarily want to maintain or deal with even though, again, there's definitely benefits to it. And also with slats, when you do have multiple slats connected back to the same module, you do have to fire them all at the same time, right? And so oftentimes I know, you know, when we're all designing shows, you know, who doesn't love doing chases and all kinds of cool inside out, outside in sequences and things like that. And, and uh, you know, um, again, if you're trying to fire all your positions at the same time, which is great, like shooting walls is awesome, but also doing sequences is good. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't mix them in. Maybe you have one, uh, one of your fronts is always going to fire at the same time, and then you have modules at each of those positions, you know, individually that, that supports chases and slats. But when you are using slats, they are wired together, and they are forced to fire at the same time. Great. Okay. Uh, if you didn't see Mr. Sparkle... Uh, go ahead and drink. He was kind of hiding here, obviously, in the upper right hand corner. Any any questions? Anything I'm the uh, important panelists you guys want to throw at me? Yeah, there is a question regarding from uh, Jeff. Um, just regarding scripting and show creator with with slats and mirrored positions. We did cover this in the show creator um, webinar, but essentially just you duplicate the same queue multiple times and then use a custom column to label what slot that queue would be in so that your reports and everything would then display that information. Yeah, you could, you could definitely, there's a couple of ways to do it in show creator. One is exactly as, as Zach mentioned, you could have multiple events with the same channel and queue, especially if you want to have different effects uh, on each of those different positions and kind of create a custom column for your position, which will help with your labeling. Uh, the other thing you could do is you could leave them as the same event and just within the description of that event, just say, Hey, you know, just type it, times three or across all positions. So, you know, there's a bunch of different ways and kind of playing around with the label feature and, and the different techniques you can, you can figure out kind of what's best, what's best for you, right? Cool, all good, move on. Please right. proceed. Please proceed, all right. Any fun polls, Joel, or are we? I have polls, but the fun well, ones are unfortunately gone. Oh no. All right, I'll try to make this as fun as possible. All right, <laughs> cost savings. So this, you have to take this slide with like a huge grain of salt, right? Because as I explained before, and I won't belabor it, but there's just so many options of the types of slides, types of cables, types of modules that we offer. Kind of the purpose of this slide is to show you these two columns on the right hand side. And again, these are just general numbers. These numbers are going to move all around depending on, you know, how you want things configured. I mean, even down to the protective accessories, you know, if you start buying aluminum slat protectors for your slats, that's going to cause the price to go up. 
you know, obviously like using a 72 Q module, you're going to get a much lower price per Q <laughs> on that module than you will like an ATM m with an armor case and a lipo. So, you know, you have to play around with these numbers on your own, but you know, the purpose here is just to kind of show you that if you do go with like a Slack cable module combo, it's just going to generally be cheaper. Um, but it's not like dramatically cheaper. I mean, it's definitely cheaper, but it's not like you're going to be like, you know, a third of the cost or anything. You know, maybe you're be, maybe you're looking at like half the cost, a little bit more, you know, or less, depending on exactly kind of how you set it up. Right. So, but there's a cost savings. Okay, so let's get to uh, some of the fun stuff. So parallel versus series, right? So parallel and series is really a, a wiring technique. This isn't anything uh, unique to pyrotechnics necessarily. It's it's just a it's just a wiring technique in general with uh, you know anyone that's involved in you know if you're an electrician or you know involved at all with um, electronic systems, series and parallel is a normal concept. And series, if you look at this right here, you'll notice that we're using kind of this light bulb example uh, for your battery, and we've got the plus and the minus. Think of this as like your actual Q on the module. So if you've got your, you know, you kind of got your red side of the uh, speaker terminal and the black side, think of the red as the positive and black as the negative, right? And basically series is when you have essentially two different igniters, right? So if I had like, these are two talons right here, right? If I were to break these things out and, and kind of consider both of the wires coming out as arms, right? Series is when kind of the arms are holding their hands and then whoever's on the end is putting one arm in the positive and one arm in the negative, right? So kind of an end to end connection. And with parallel, it's a little bit different. It's as if like every E match had an arm coming at two arms coming out of it and everyone's putting one of their hands in the red and everyone's putting one of their hands in the black. And that's a parallel connection, right? So if you just kind of replace these with E matches, that's how you would end up wiring them up. And slats, uh, when you're purchasing slats, you'll notice like on this guy right here, this actually has the word series on it. All we're doing, and I know it, it's, it's not that easy to grasp your hand, head around, but even though all these slats kind of look the same and they all have cables connecting to them, through the traces, which are basically just the electronic paths within the circuit board, we are emulating series or parallel based on how those traces are connected within this physical PCB board, okay? Now, there's kind of pros and cons to using series versus parallel. Uh, generally speaking, with series, uh, within the Cobra world, we can fire more EMATCH or MJG igniters using series, and that's pretty much just because Cobra happens to have higher voltage <laughs> within our power sources, right? So when you're using nine, two 9-volt nine batteries, it's about 18 volts. Our LiPo, uh, even though it's 14.8 volts, actually supplies about 16 and a half volts at full charge. Um, that higher voltage is generally going to support more uh, E-matches or MGG initiators in series. So you can fire about 10 in series versus in parallel about four if you're using LiPo, uh, excuse me, if you're using 9-volt or about eight if you're using LiPo. So just a little bit more when you're firing in series over parallel. The other benefit of uh, series is that if you did have a bad EMATCH or MJG igniter, uh, then you're not gonna get good continuity in most cases, right? And so having a bad EMATCH will identify itself in series. In parallel, you may not because the other EMATCH is gonna satisfy that continuity circuit and you're not necessarily going to know it on the on the uh, you know on your module or the 18 or two or your control panel, depending on where you're checking continuity. And also, if you do have a bad E match in series, you do run the risk of you know uh, having the circuit fail. So you may have partial or, or complete failure of that series circuit. However, I definitely want to note that you know if you're purchasing like a high quality E match or igniter. So for example, the MGG igniters are a very high quality product. Um, if you're purchasing high quality EMATCH from your supplier, generally speaking, even though there is the risk, there's a risk of a bad EMATCH showing good continuity, but causing a failure within your circuit, that risk is fairly low uh, to the point where it shouldn't pr prevent you from, from firing in series. Firing in series is generally a very reliable 
method to use, um, especially if you're using high quality EMATCH and MG, or MJG igniters. Um, you will find sometimes the professional companies that, that tend to buy a very, very inexpensive EMATCH and they're okay with you know, perhaps um, some lack of quality. You'll find they more, may more often fire in parallel than in series, but obviously it's, it's a very uh, subjective and completely personal choice. Great, now, and you'll notice here, I've got a little chart. Uh, when we do publish this to YouTube, we will have links in the description below. So don't feel free that you have to memorize any of this. And these are just kind of some general guidelines to show you based on using eMatch, Talons. Uh, and, and actually, you'll notice here that within Talons, it says not available. That's because you do not want to fire Talons in series. And that's just due to the fact that Talons uh, fire the filament at a different rate per talon. There's just such a manufacturing variance within the, uh, the resistance of that talon and how long it takes to burn that if you're trying to put multiple talons in series, it's very common for one of those talons to break its circuit early. And then once that circuit is open within this series connection, it's not going to give enough time to the rest of those talon igniters to heat up to the proper temperature to burn into the actual uh, fuse to cause that fuse to fire. So you, that's why you see talons are unavailable here, but you'll see here that as your distance of, of wire extends, and this is the total distance, uh, excuse me, the, the, the distance between your, uh, your module and your slat, or your slat and your slat, basically the length of the cable, not the to and back distance, but just the, uh, just the, the overall distance. Uh, is represented right here. So for example, if your two slots are 100 feet apart, you can use this at 100 feet, not 200 feet because it has to go in both directions. And as those numbers um, go up as far as distance, the total number that you can fire goes down. And you know, one thing that we'll mention, and I'll mention this a couple times, is that you know, the best way to know what your maximum number of E-matches, MJG igniters, or talons that you can fire based on your power source type of cable, whether you're purchasing those cables from us, or not from us, is to actually do practical tests. So if, you, if you're gonna spend the time and the money to have you know, five slats over a 200 foot front with a single module and a LiPo or an external power input, you know, and you've got you know, potentially 100 plus cakes or different types of ground effects firing, you know, take the half an hour, take the hour to set up uh, one queue across all those slats, put in a maximum of say, you know, 20% above what you plan on firing during your show and just fire some quick match or fire some fuse and just see if that goes properly based on your power source. That hour invested in, in, in testing your system before the show will be very valuable in, in knowing what you can fire because you don't want to leave your show you know, walk back out in the field and feel disappointed because you got a bunch of unfired cakes or talons that didn't heat up enough to fire your igniters because you didn't understand what those maximums were. So trial and error and just using a practical test in the end, even though it's crude, uh, is really the best way to ultimately know what you can fire in maximum. Great, now jumping to parallel. Uh, you know, parallel, you can fire less E-match or talons in general. And again, that's, that's not necessarily due to the wiring technique. It just happens to be that the power source that we're using uh, generates less current. Right, so amperage, you need, you need higher amperage in parallel and higher voltage in series. And you know, using uh, two 9 volt batteries in series, you know, generally around four uh, towns or MGG match uh, in, in parallel. And when you're using LiPo, that's about double that amount. Uh, with parallel, you are unable to identify bad E-match. Again, we talked about this before. You know, if one of them's good, one of them's bad, you're not gonna know because the good one is gonna satisfy this circuit. And the other thing too is, uh, this is actually a positive, that a bad E-match or a bad talent is not gonna prevent the others from firing, right? Which we also kind of talked a little bit about this before. It's kind of the opposite of series that, you know, since they're wired in parallel, they're kind of like their own independent circuit and they're not dependent on one another and they won't cause each other to not fire. And again, we have a little bit of a chart here. Uh, don't feel free. Don't feel you have to memorize this. And again, practical testing is the best. But we will have links to this in the within the video that we post to YouTube. Excellent. Uh, any questions on series or parallel from the panelists at this point? Nope. Nope. All right. Excellent. All right. So voltage versus current. 
as you'll see that uh, we've got series and parallel. We, so we're just going to talk very briefly about how series circuits require more voltage, parallel requires more current. Uh, we've got two light bulbs, and it looks like, oh my, Mr. Sparkle has uh, decided to put his head around one of our light bulbs. Bad Mr. Sparkle. All right. Uh, <laughs> so in series, uh, it does require more voltage. Uh, it requires the same amount of current, right? So let's say you had an E-match that required one and a half volts to fire, and let's say a half an amp to fire. When you have two of them in series, it may require three volts, which is twice one and a half, and you'd still require the same amount of current, which is about one half amp to fire. And this, you don't, if this doesn't make sense, it doesn't need to, uh, we'll cover this in a bit more detail. So a little bit more advanced, but if you are interested, this is some of the kind of more theoretical discussions around it. And with a uh, series, uh, with our battery sources, a, our LiPo battery has about 16 and a half volts. Our nine volts together has about 18 volts in series. And with parallel, it does require more current. So the voltage that's required is about the same when you're wiring in parallel, but the current goes up as you wire in parallel because the resistance actually goes down, right? So in this case of, let's use our example of one and a half volts on both for the voltage and a half amp for the current. In that situation, uh, you'd still only require one and a half volts, but you would actually require one amp because that's uh, a half of an amp. Uh, so again, same amount of voltage. And with our nine volt batteries, assuming you're using Energizer, nine volt batteries, uh, about three amps that you would expect, a minimum of about three amps. And then again, a minimum of about five amps would come out of our LiPo batteries that we sell. Excellent. Okay, so we're gonna talk a bit. This is, I think, one of our last topics here with is here, you know, when as we get into um, more complicated stuff. So this is actually, this was a requested question that came earlier, so we kind of added it to this, uh, this, this presentation, is hybrid wiring. So what is hybrid wiring? Well, hybrid wiring would be the case where you're actually trying to wire uh, a combination of both series and parallel circuits into the same queue. So if you kind of, in your mind, don't look at this yellow and this white circuit, and you just look at the green one, you'll notice that on this green one, we, we basically simulated uh, three E matches in series on a single queue. And then what we've done is we've actually replicated that three times. So we're actually firing nine E matches in total. However, that's being done across three separate uh, series circuits wired in parallel, <laughs> okay? And so what we do is we kind of run the math here and we say that, well, uh, we've got three series circuits, each of them, let's imagine it's like, uh, uh, let's say two volts per E match, which would effectively be six volts total. Uh, and since we're wiring them in parallel, we kind of have like three six volt E matches, right? And that voltage is not going to go up because they're all wired in parallel. But since they're wired in parallel, assuming we require one amp to fire each uh, E match, it would require a total of three amps, okay? And again, I don't expect anyone to really understand this. And I'm sure some people are completely following me along, but if you don't understand what I'm saying, don't really worry about it. The only point I'm trying to make here is that we have had clients, uh, because we don't normally recommend hybrid wiring, you will not hear us like typically recommend this, but I will tell you because this is a webinar and you know we just wanna be super transparent and kind of explaining everything, that we have had people do this. And, and we've actually had people put like 10 E matches in series on a queue, and then they've replicated that like three times on the same queue to fire a total of 30 E matches at once, right? Because in theory, uh, you know, as you add each of those uh, separate 10 E match circuits together, uh, you're not actually increasing the voltage uh, because as we talked about in the previous slide, we're only increasing the current, right? And so as long as your, your battery can provide enough current uh, for all three of those, you should be fine. And again, run those tests. So if you want to have some fun, if you're looking to fire a lot, um, or if you just want to like email us, and I, and I said this before and I'll say it again, you know, don't stress yourself out over this stuff. If you're curious and you need help, you know, Cobra's like, you know, as hopefully everybody knows, we're all about customer service, right? So we want to make your life easier. So don't feel bad about contacting us. Ask questions. Our team 
you know, myself, Zach, or anyone else, uh, Ian Barr, and a couple, you know, whoever else is on our team is, is happy to help answer questions for you guys. So, you know, I'll kind of end it with that, with that on this kind of stuff. If, if you need help, reach out to us. And, and we're also, one of the cool things is we're trying to build some really neat online tools to make this simple. So like the idea that you could have like an interface where you can drag stuff around a field, tell it what you're looking to do, have it tell you not, whether or not, you know, you may be pushing your limits. You know, those are things that we'd love to introduce in the, in the future to make your lives a little bit easier. Okay, uh, right, so we'll try to continue. Hopefully I'm not boring people too much here. We do uh, have a question here. Yes, please. Yeah, so Austin has asked, if you're shooting one MJG igniter off of a module and mirroring that on a few slats, uh, would series slats be recommended over parallel or would it matter? If, can, you, can you read that one more time? If you read it quickly, I can. Yeah, for sure. If you're shooting one MJG igniter off a module and mirroring that on a few slats, would series slats ah, be gotcha. recommended over parallel or would it matter? Yeah, that's a great question. That actually came up and I should have added that to this web, webinar. So uh, a lot of, the, so the question is to everybody, let's say you have a module, right? And then you connect that module to one series slat, right? So even if, if you imagine in my little, presentation here just pretend these two slats don't exist right here <laughs> and you've got in a module here and you've got a series slat here in this situation this series slat is actually being fired in parallel to this module right so you've got e-matches plugged into here you've got an e-match plugged into here or in the in the case of the question an mgg igniter these are being fired in parallel as you start to add more slats, like in this case right here, we have multiple series slats. These three series slats are being connected directly to this module, uh, and uh, you know, but they're being connected in parallel, right? And so what you would normally hear from us is we would say, don't wire directly to this module and only wire directly to these series slats because otherwise it would create a hybrid situation right uh, but what so what we would normally tell you is that hey for this cable that's right here make this like a little one meter cable so it's really close to the module and then for these two cables make these longer right so if it's three positions you're not having a really really long cable right here and you just have a short cable here and then long cables here however uh, as I mentioned in the hybrid wiring question it's okay to wire directly to this module and then have that fire in parallel to these series slats. Um, you know, and it's okay to do that. It would likely fire just fine. But again, just make sure that you run a test to make sure that's working based on your situation. By, by, by putting this together in hybrid doesn't mean it's not gonna fire. It's just that the calculations become a little bit more difficult and we normally don't recommend it. But if you wanna test it out on your own, feel free to do so. But generally speaking, if you were to talk to us, and I apologize, I know this is a long-winded answer, we would say don't wire to the module only wire to the series slats and use the short cable right here. Okay, any others? Hopefully that answer. I apologize, I think it was Nathan or John or whoever. No, that was it on that one, yeah. Okay, thanks. All right, so one quick thing with series slats, we're gonna talk a little bit about shunts and jumpers, okay? And so if we switch over to my camera, I'll show you really quick. Um, I'll grab from my handy box of tricks here. So here we have our series slat, right? This little guy that I'm holding in my hand right here, this is what's called a shunt, okay? And a shunt is essentially, this is just like a little uh, cap that's gonna go on the end of your slat, okay? And what you can't really see is, you may think that this is just like an open connection, but in here there's actually a little, it's a PCB circuit board right here, and you'll see all of the 25 DD25 pins. And in this circuit board, you won't be able to see it, but there's actually traces that connect every single one of those pins together, okay? And when you're wiring in series, as I'll show you within this diagram, you'll notice that on the last of the series shun, uh, on the last of the series slats on the right, you're always gonna wanna put that shunt. So you'll see here right now, I'm going to place my shunt right on the end of my slat. It has a nice friction hold, and it's basically just gonna sit there, right? And that shunt allows us to complete that series circuit, okay? 
and, uh, and it allows it to ultimately fire. So a lot of times we'll get the support call where people are like, hey, I'm using series slats, but I'm, I'm not seeing any continuity. Or worst case, they're wiring a bunch of stuff to their ATM and they're seeing continuity because these are, this ATM is wired in parallel to your series slats. And then they go to fire their show and none of their series slats fire and saying, Hey, you know, Cobra didn't fire any of these series slats. Well, it's because you didn't have the shunt on the end, right? And your ATM was satisfying your continuity circuit, right? So make sure when you're doing this, and that's also kind of another reason why we don't recommend wiring to the module, but just make sure in series cases, you've got the shunt on the end. Also, if there's a situation in which you're wiring e matches in not all of the positions, like in this case right here, let's imagine this was Q1 on the first slat, Q1 on the last slat. You want to run a jumper wire to uh, between the red and the black terminal within this slat, right? And what this is going to do is by having that jump wire, kind of like the shunt, it's very similar to a shunt. It's almost like you're shunting this, this cue. That's going to allow for the circuit, you know, the electricity to come out, go around here, go through the jumper wire, go back through here and then all the way back through the slats to the module firing all of these accordingly. Right. And you, and again, like, even though this kind of makes sense, this is another reason why slats can kind of become a little bit tricky and difficult as we are dealing with concept concepts like this. Okay. Uh, so fully shunting parallel and series slats, right? So <laughs> with series slats, if you want to shunt your slat and by, by, by this, I'm not talking about what we just talked about in our last conversation. What I'm talking about is mainly if you're pre-wiring to a slat, right? So if you've got like a front position, you're pre-wiring to it, and you want to ensure that that slat is properly shunted such that, you know, if electrostatic discharge were to enter into the slat, you don't want any type of MJG uh, igniter or E-match to inadvertently fire. When you have a series slat, you want to make sure that you've got that shunt on both sides of that slat, okay? Um, however, if this is a parallel slat, you wanna only have one shunt on the end of the slat. You do not need shunts on both ends, um, but you can put Mr. Sparkle on one side, that's okay, right? So Mr. Sparkle's okay on one end of the slat, um, but you only need one shunt, right? All right, so hopefully that made sense. Good. So a quick, um, quick yeah. um, thing here. So question is, would I need a jumper on the mod? No, because the module's wired in parallel. That's correct, um, yeah. Do you. not put a jumper on the module. If you put a jumper on the module, you will, it, it's gonna be disastrous because the, all the electricity is gonna take the path of least resistance, which is right through that jumper wire on your module and none of your cues are gonna fire. So you're actually gonna show good continuity across your, your circuit, like your, mo your module's gonna say good continuity, your 18 r 2 your control panel's gonna all say good continuity, but nothing's gonna fire because it's gonna be a dead short. Okay, great. Um, okay, so last but not least, we're gonna talk, a, excuse me, a bit about um, Talon and MJG initiators, kind of uh, what are the uses of talons versus MJG initiators. And we're also gonna show you how to actually wire an initiator into a into firework product, right? So let's go here. So talons, which I've got right here. So you'll notice here's a, here's a talon, right? Saying hello to you. And this talon uh, is specifically designed for visco fuse, right? So a lot of times people say, well, what's better? Towns or, or initiators. Well, it's not like one's better or one's worse. It's really what are they designed for, right? So talons are designed for connecting directly to visco fuse. So if I have a piece of visco fuse that I'm showing right here, a talon is designed for you to place just like a clothespin going over a clothesline. You place that right onto that fuse and it connects on, right? And if you were to do that, for example, we have, and again, you can drink to Mr. Crackle as well. And so imagine that fuse was in Mr. Crackle here. Uh, you would place that right onto the fuse and then you would use some type of strain relief tape, like duct tape, gorilla tape, gaff tape, like you name it, something just to kind of place over this. So you clip it right onto the fuse and we'll leave Mr. Crackle right here. And that goes on the visco fuse. And then there's basically within that talon, there's a little, uh, it's actually a tungsten filament 
and it's like a coiled up piece of tungsten, almost like a slinky that's been stretched out, right? And as, as it clamps over that fuse, that slinky, obviously in much uh, lesser diameter, kind of wraps around the surface of that fuse. So when that tungsten wire gets really, really, really hot, it actually burns almost like, like a toaster filament, right? Uh, into the exterior of that fuse, into the black powder core, causing that fuse to essentially ignite, right? And so talons are very much designed for the purpose of lighting consumer visco fuse. One of the benefits of talons is that they are a fairly low effort attachment. Like you just kind of clip it on and put some tape on. It's not that big of a deal or that big of an effort to do. Um, and kind of one of the downsides is that you can only wire talons in parallel based on the reasons I explained uh, before due to the amount of time that that wire burns and the manufacturing variability. And also the downside, not so much of talons, but when you're clipping onto a fuse, you've got a slow ignition, right? And it depends, obviously, if you're going to clip that talon to the end of the fuse, maybe versus the base of the fuse, the amount of time it takes for this, for our good friend, Mr. Crackle, to ignite up in the air is going to depend and, and it's not going to be instant, right? You're going to have that, that, that pause. And if you're trying to do tightly timed pyro musicals, uh, that's not very conducive to doing that. Um, but if you're not doing tightly timed pyro musicals, it's great. So you can just kind of clip it right onto the fuse and you're good to go. Now with MJG igniters, it's a bit different. MJG igniters, you know, up until a few years ago, you know, you couldn't, purchase this, this type of product unless you had an ATF Type 54 license. So that's one of the benefit of MG, MG initiators is that you can purchase this as a consumer. You know, we do, the shipping is a little bit more expensive because we have to ship it as hazmat, um, but it's essentially a consumer legal e-match, which is awesome. So how cool is that that you can basically purchase a professional product, um, you know, as a, as a consumer without a license? Um, you know, but like Spider-Man with great power comes great responsibility. And so what we do, what I do want to show you today is just kind of a proper technique for, uh, for placing an initiator into a consumer-based product. And I kind of do want to show this to you guys because I want to show you the safe way of effectively doing it. So whenever you're, whenever you're doing this, you want to make sure that obviously you're outdoors. You want to make sure that whenever you are handling your pyrotechnic product, that the, uh, you know, the, the location of wherever the fireworks are going to come out is not facing towards you. So consider this like you know, a loaded gun. <laughs> you never want to point the barrel in your face. You always want to point that uh, in, a, in a safe direction where, there's, where if this were to inadvertently go off, you know, in that worst case, it would never you know, uh, you know, hopefully reduce the risk of causing harm. And the other thing is, and I don't have one right here, but I'm going to use this, this, this wooden dowel to represent um, something like a brass awl. And you wanna use brass because brass is a non-sparking metal. So if you Google like brass awl or um, RIP, our good friend, uh, Wild Willie, if you guys know what I'm talking about, used to create this product called a pyro poke. Um, but if you Google pyro poke or brass awl, basically you wanna find like uh, kind of a non-sparking poking device, uh, brass uh, product. Don't use like a screwdriver. Because what happens is if you place that uh, a sparking metal into here with the right amount of friction, you may create a spark and it's kind of obvious what would happen if the spark were to ignite within your, your firework. So what you do is you want to normally, this is like our fuse and we've got our fuse placed into our firework here. What you normally want to do is kind of like tear that fuse out. And some people will, you know, some people are okay with leaving the fuse in here and that's fine. You can leave the fuse in there. It's not a problem. Um, I personally like to take it out, but that's just me. Um, and then what you do is you take your brass awl and either you can kind of poke it into that same hole that you've got. Sometimes people may take like a, a razor blade, but be careful or some other type of cutting device to kind of peel back the cardboard and expose the, the initial tube. So a lot of times with fireworks, especially cakes, there's like a whole bunch of tubes within them. That fuse is normally going into the lift charge of the first tube. So you kind of want to peel back some of that cardboard if you like, or just place your brass awl right into this guy. And then you can kind of round that out. And the idea is that you're using that awl to kind of bore a larger hole than the fuse normally fills into, right? So I actually broke my dowel here, but I kind of boring a bigger hole, right? And then what you're going to do is you're going to take your MJG initiator, which has this, this little red thing right here. We refer to this as the shroud. 
Uh, the reason that this has this, this protective cap, you can kind of slide in and out, like exposing the EMATS, right? The reason that we have this, this shroud on here, and this is, this is nothing that Cobra invented, uh, was because when, these, when you're transporting EMATS within the box, uh, EMATS or MGG initiators can be friction sensitive. So this little kind of match head here, if, if you know, scraped up against something or if impacted against something, may inadvertently fire, right? And so having this shroud, it kind of provides a bit of like a, like a protection. So, you know, almost like a, like a little bicycle helmet for the EMATCH head, <laughs> right? And so what you'll do then is you'll take this, uh, take this MGG initiator and you, you can either pull the shroud back and place this directly into your hole, or you can leave the shroud on there, which some argue by having the shroud here and you place this into the firework that shroud helps allow the heat and the flame that emits from the initiator when it's fired to directionally go right into that lift charge of the product right so it's absolutely fine to leave the shroud in there place it in and oftentimes when you're pushing the initiator into the lift charge of your product you'll feel it almost kind of like um uh, crackle, not to Mr. Crackle here, but it, it kind of, it's almost like coffee grinds, right? Or like an instant coffee. It's like these little crystallized powder uh, elements. And when you push it in there, you almost feel it kind of like pressing into almost like those like crystallized instant coffee grounds is it, probably the best way to describe it. And once you feel that, you know, you've hit the lift, go ahead and you can just kind of pull this back. And then again, place, you know, duct tape, grill tape, gaff tape, whatever type of tape you want to place that strain relief right over that wire so that that, 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 that shroud and that, that initiator maintains the same position within the lift, right? And then oftentimes you can take it and even you know, on the back, place another piece of tape over here and then you know, put your label on the product and, and kind of move on, right? And, and that's really the technique. Once you've done that, you know, understand that, that, that you do have a, a live igniter in the lift charge of your product, right? And while initiators, which I'll point out, you can kind of see this, I don't know if you see this in here, but there's this little like piece of, uh, this is called a shunt, right? So we talked about slat shunts. Well, this is like, think of this as a mini shunt for your EMATCH. So you can actually take your thumb here, you could flick this off, you can pull it off, but what this shunt is doing is it's effectively contacting the uh, shorting out these two wires. So again, if there was like, you know, electrostatic discharge into this, you know, the electricity would go through the shunt, not through the E-match and prevent this from firing. Um, however, understand that even though that there's a shunt within here or even a shunt on your slat, you know, this little tiny piece of metal <laughs> or this shunt right here is the only thing that's protecting, you know, electrostatic discharge from causing that E-match to fire. So even though you are protected, it's one point of protection and that you really want to do everything you can to mitigate the risk of, you know, either keeping product within an indoor environment or any form of transport at all. So even though you are shunted and protected, you have to understand that you are always at risk in any situation and that you want to minimize and mitigate as much risk as you can, um, you know, with these types of techniques, especially in the form of transport with any type of product. Whew. Okay, that was long-winded, so I apologize. Hopefully that was informative. Um, it is a higher effort attachment, as, as was obvious. Obviously, once you get good at this, it goes pretty quickly. It is instant ignition, so if you are using MJG initiators and placing them to lift, I will say it is quite satisfying, to, uh, especially if you're just pressing a button, <laughs> to feel as if literally the thumb going down on that button causes that firework to go off. It's really, really cool. So I do, if you, if you do a lot of scripting and you do like manually firing, it's always a lot of fun to fire with uh, initiators in, in the product. And obviously, the obvious is with pyro musicals when you're trying to do tightly timed uh, scripts, you know, MJG initiators are the way to go. So if you, if you ever see shows where you've got these really awesome chases and fronts and these really cool timed precision events, you know, I would say that the vast majority, if not all the time, they're using some type of an e-match or initiator type product right within the lift of whatever pyrotechnic device that they're firing. Excellent, so that, that basically concludes, uh, that concludes our uh, presentation. 
Uh, you see my socks are now making their debut. And I will skip, I'll skip back to my, uh, so this is me actually sitting on the floor. And so anyway, I will now, with horrible lighting, <laughs> I will answer any, any questions. And we've got our full panelists here so we can answer any questions that you guys have um, about Slasser Igniters or really anything else. So, and one thing to note is we're gonna have kind of two phases to our Q&A. We'll have our formal Q&A right now, uh, which I'm sure the panelists will throw out any types of questions for myself or any other panelists. And then once we're done that formal Q&A, we'll say thank you. And then we'll all just kind of hang out for you know a little bit. And if you've got any other types of informal questions, feel free to ask those and, and chill out with us for a few minutes and have a good time. So um, anyway, that being said, thank you guys. And uh, yeah, go ahead, Joel or Zach or anyone else, if you guys want to fire away with any questions. Yeah, so we got a question here uh, from a few people. Um, can I fire, I can't remember if this was covered myself actually, sorry. Uh, can I fire both MJG and Talons uh, during the same show? So you can, you just obviously have to have your module on the specific mode for that uh, igniter. If you're using the same, sorry, if you're using Talons and Igniter on the same module, you'd want to use um, Talon mode. Oh, there's a cat in the background. Yeah, <laughs> you'd, want to use, you'd want to use the Talon mode, but you want to ensure that you're not firing another queue for the full two seconds, um, just because you run the risk of shorting and uh, causing subsequent queues not to fire. Yeah, that's correct. Use to, if you are mixing match or MGG igniters with Talons in the same module, you can use Talon mode. Just make sure that you've got two seconds in between those queues in the event that the first e match or initiator does short. You don't want electricity going through the short and not through the igniter that you want to have fire, which is that kind of stuff. That's just a two second gap between cues. Any other questions? It's gotta be a few. Yeah, I'm just trying to get more clarification from Thomas. Um, he asked, is there any chance of increasing the fail rate using this method? So Thomas, if you want to just comment back and kind of just clarify what you mean. So I'm assuming that the flow. I'll do that um, Yeah, go ahead. I'm actually seeing. No, go ahead. Go ahead <laughs> Austin Williams saying, do you have to use Talon mode if you're firing Talons off of parallel slat too? Um, yeah, anytime that Talons or E matches are used on a module or a slat connected to that module, you need to have that module in the respected respective uh, mode there. Uh, Thomas has clarified to say that uh, by removing the fusing, are you increasing your risk of, of failure? Like pulling out the Visco fuse to match directly, I believe? I, I don't think so at all. But uh, And again, like I, I'm one opinion. If you ask 10 people that, you may get a different answer. But I, my personal opinion is by removing the fuse, you know, when, and, and, and an E-match or an MJG initiator is not designed to fire fuse. So if you think about a fuse, it has a lacquer coating to it. That lacquer coating is to prevent against, you know, moisture and other elements from, uh, you know, getting into that powder core. And, you know, E-matches and initiators aren't really designed to fire fuse. So while the fuse in itself is an element that can be ignited, in my opinion, by putting the fuse in there, it's preventing the heat that's coming out of that e-match or initiator from contacting what you want it to contact which is the black powder right so while you know so i would say that by removing it you're not uh decreasing the chances but you know i guess everyone's got their own opinion so glenn also brought up a good point if you do have a non-fire situation because of removing the fuse if you hang on to it and that way you can safely um, light it at a later time once the show is over. Um, that would be a good idea. Sure. So um, Jeff asked, uh, so with the approximate 10 E match limit, um, how is the impact if I fire all 18 cues at the same time on the same module? Um, do, we don't recommend firing more than one cue at the same time on a module, Jeff. Just a whole uh, short, right? Yeah, no, that's, yeah, exactly right. That's going to exceed it. Um, one thing I will mention here, I'm going to show my screen uh, briefly here. And just bear with me really, really quick. 
Uh, we also, Cobra does offer uh, quick fire clips. Okay, so if you, if you see this on my screen right now, this is a product that's on our website. Uh, they're actually designed specifically for uh, wiring directly into cakes or other pyrotechnic devices. You can actually place your initiator into this and this will focus the, 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 the heat and the fire into the lift charge of your product. So if you haven't used these before, these are something you can purchase and experiment with. Um, uh, so if anyone has experience with these, I, I haven't used them a ton, but, but they're kind of cool. So if anyone comments on them, they can say if they've had good experience or bad experience, but this, uh, we haven't had a lot of complaints, right, Zach? Like a lot of people, do we get complaints on this product much or is it, I don't think so. And I know we sell a decent amount of them, right? Yeah, not, not too much. A lot of it's, you, you kind of get two sides who love them and two and the other side that hates them. It, it's just personal preference. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, I just did want to mention that. So thank you, Ryan, for, for bringing up that suggestion. But I just wanted to go back to Jeff because I don't know if uh, there's a, a like on his comment. Um, on the same module, you shouldn't be firing more than one cue at the same time, right? So you'd want to connect multiple igniters to one cue if you need to fire more than one igniter at once on the same module. Um, and then you'd want to separate them by the fire time. So if it's a Talon, you, you separate each cue by two seconds. If it's MJG or EMATCH, separate each cue by a tenth of a second there. Yeah, and that doesn't mean that you necessarily can't fire the same cue. So there's nothing technically stopping you from firing multiple cues on the module. You know, it's really more like Zach said, it's, you know, efficiently using your cues, right? Why would you, you know, necessarily, unless you're running them in, well, actually, even if you're running in different directions, that's fine. But the idea is that why not just wire to the same cue? Because in the end, they're just, they're drawing from the same power source, right? So why, why, um, why waste cues? <clears throat> when you can wire them to the same one. Uh, so Glenn asks, other than a false continuity test, what are the other negatives of connecting an igniter uh, to a module and to a slat? Uh, just, I think, hybrid wiring, which we kind of talked about before. So, and that's really mainly in the situation where you have series slats connected to a module. So like we talked about before, if you've got a bunch of E-matches to the module, a bunch of E-matches to series slats, you know, you're, it's a hybrid. So, hope, you know, which again, you just, through trial and error, practical testing that confirm that. Hopefully that answered that, Glenn. It, and again, with any of these questions, like Glenn, if that didn't answer your question, feel free to email us or call us and we can absolutely answer that for you in better detail. Um, Jeff had asked regarding quick plugs. Um, if you're firing three comments from the same station at the same time, um, you just want to, the easiest way to do that would just be to cut the, the igniter about, you know, an inch or two up from the quick plug and then wire back in the other igniter. So you're still using one cue and you're still retaining the ability to use that quick plug. Just take an extra minute, but it's got, yeah. Today. Like if you've yeah. got a quick plug here, right. And you said, Hey, I want to wire, like, let's say I want to wire two of these together in series. Right. What I would do is I would literally like cut this. <laughs> right and then I would remove this head right and then I would literally wire that in series as if I just had a regular e-match that did not have a quick plug in so if you think about it you can just cut these right off um, but obviously if you want to plug one of them into the module you can but you want to kind of splice these and cut these and kind of make your own little series circuit by, by cutting the wire. Um, are we offering a twist lock the for ProLine 76 for E-Match? I think that's in the works. Yeah, Jonah, did, can you answer that one, Jonah? Ben, Sorry, yes, I was muted here. here. Uh, yes, it is something we're working on. We are hoping to have them before the fourth. Uh, we are working with MJG to get these in for both the um, regular 10-foot igniters with the standard connection option with just the wires as well as our quick plugs. And uh, Chris has asked, um, if setting the module to Talon mode to fire a higher number of initiators, will this increase my likelihood of firing all initiators if even they all don't go off instantaneously? Do you want me to answer that? Yeah, yeah for sure. Okay, yeah. So we that's a common question, which is, hey, I want a higher likelihood of... So the short answer is no. In, in fact, we definitely do not encourage you to put that module in Talon mode 
if your goal is to try to fire more initiators, uh, a typical e-match or an MJG initiator will fire in a very short period of time, you know, commonly somewhere around maybe like 30 milliseconds is all it takes for that initiator or e-match to fire. And for the 10th of a second fire, pulse time, that's about three times that length, right? So, you know, um, even though that's a very short period of time, in, in the world of an igniter, that's actually uh, a very long period of time. So by increasing that to two seconds, you may inadvertently cause for other things to not fire when you're trying to fire things quickly on the module. So it is not necessary and it will not help you by going into Talon mode to fire larger quantities of E-matches or MGG igniters on the same queue. And uh, Joe has asked when the RJ45 breakout cable is officially added to the site. Uh, will it be a cable option when purchasing a module with DB25 connections? Uh, well, you'll be able to definitely purchase them separately, right? So there's no question about that. We may make that an option when you're purchasing a module, but probably not. We'll probably just make it as a related product on the website and just make it obvious that you can purchase them. And uh, But definitely as separate products, which is really serving the same purpose because ultimately we're going to just put it in a box with everything else that we ship to you. Uh, Thomas is asking, is there a voltage or amperage difference on the output depending on how the module's set? I'm assuming you mean Talon or E-Match mode. Um, no, there's no difference between. Just whatever, it's what the the battery or the power source is supplying. Yeah, it's how long it's the queue's firing for. Yeah, exactly. It's just controlling the, the length of that pulse. Yeah. Yep. And along the same lines, other people ask if the voltage mode impacts the output voltage, it doesn't. The voltage mode, when you change it on a module, doesn't change how much voltage is outputted. It just, it's, it's really meant internally by the module to, to know what voltage it expects for determining battery life readings. Chris is asking if the quick fire clips require the removal of Visco. No, you could put them in with the Visco there as well. Yeah, but I would, again, I would, my personal preference is not to do that. I know Joel, maybe you've got a different feeling on that. They're, they're designed so you can just plug it right yeah. in without yeah, the fuse. Kind of just jam it in there. Yeah, you literally follow the fuse to the hole and just shove it right okay. in there. Okay. Okay. It can be a little time consuming if you're trying to pull the fuse out, especially if they knot it, right? There's always that big knot that gets. Right, exactly. Yeah. You might spend more time on that when you could just punch it right in. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point, Jonah. Thomas is asking, uh, he says, I use 72Ms. When are you going to make it so I can set the individual point for E match versus talent? I assume you mean when are we going to set each, give you the option to make individual banks have a talent or E match mode? Or cues. He may be referring down to cues. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, so, I mean, the short answer to that is 6.0 through scripting supports variable pulse times per queue. Um, it's not as difficult, it's not as easy. So, it's not just like an interface in the module where you can set them variably. Um, so in scripting, you could do that in 6.0, but it's not 100% potentially what you're looking for, especially if it's a manual show. So we kind of get a little bit closer in 6.0 with that. Uh, feel free, Zach, to just throw it. Yeah, feel free, yeah. Zach, to just keep... I can, I can, I see him right on the screen. So. No, 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 for sure. So, so Thomas Bell, he asked again, this bring me back to the last question. With the 72M, can I break the module apart as far as timing? Um, that would be, as, as Scott said, with 6.0, you're going to have the ability to, by event, change the pulse time uh, up to 20 seconds, I believe. Uh, or longer, yeah. Longer than 20 seconds? Yeah, we'd have to, uh, we have to get into, I don't know. It, no, it, it's going to be 20 right now. Oh, it's 20 seconds. And okay. what's, what's the lowest you can, can set Tenth. it to? Tenth Tenth. a second? Yeah, so Thomas, I guess, as Scott kind of mentioned there before, is with 6.0 from each event, you could theoretically go ahead and, and communicate to the module through a script on how long you want that pulse to go, whether it be a tenth of a second for E-match or yeah. two seconds for a talent. And I, I saw your message, I'm waiting on 7.1, Thomas. I would definitely call us or emails on that because I'm really curious what specific application that you're that that may be a requirement for you for your show because there may be other ways to work around that because um, it's not com it's I, I can't I probably less than three times ever have I heard the, the need specifically 
on a, on a certain module to get down to that that precision of EMATCH versus Talon on each queue, unless it's more of a special effects type application. So uh, long duration, oh yeah, so. Uh, Rock was asking, can you, add, can you use another brand of slat with Cobra? Um, there are third party slats that are on the market that, that do work with Cobra. So as long as the pinouts match, then yeah, you, you can use other slats. We, we encourage third party applications. So it's, you know, obviously do your research, make sure they work, make sure they're high quality. Uh, but you know, we have no problem answering questions the best that we can for any type of product that may work with our system. So we've got a few questions regarding the use of E matches and actually putting them into the lift charge of a shell. Um, I, I personally not sure. Uh, is a problem with putting MGT into a mortar lift charge? Uh, I I wouldn't recommend. I don't. You know, typically mortars have quick match, yeah. uh, and so I, I I'm saying one four. Yeah, so Chris, Chris had said 1-4. There's some general questions regarding uh, so in, lift charge. In theory, you could, but I'd be more concerned about if that shell will then fit into the tube. Um, uh, I've seen it done on YouTube, and it works. With the, with the quick clips? Uh, not with the quick clips. Just yeah, that's, that's what he's asking about, is quick clips into a 1-4 ball or cancer shell. Normally, there's not yeah. a whole lot of extra room in that. Yeah, not, not with the quick clips, but certainly just like placing an initiator or an e-match into Oh, the yeah, lift. absolutely. Direct, direct lift if a shell. canister shell, yeah, you could definitely do that. I've seen Yeah, that. We've, we've got a couple. The couple questions were just general in terms of the mortar, and then there was the one pertaining to using the quick, quick fire. Right. Um, George asks, does... Oh, I think so. It just went away. <laughs> Does six zero uh, <laughs> offer one one hundredth of a second? And uh, yeah, that's already supported on hardware B uh, modules with five zero. Yep. Uh, pyro, I'll just hit these pyro musicals with comments and spiral effects. What am I looking at? I, uh, yeah, that's probably. I would email us on that, Thomas. I'm not sure how they say it, exactly answer that because I think that's getting into more like design of specific types of uh, pyrotechnic, more advanced pyrotechnic mounting and timing. Um, one point, Jeff says one point, one and three quarter inch don't. So I guess he's suggesting don't on a canister shell. Although I have seen it done, but yeah. Um, so Dustin wow. asked, why would you need 20 seconds on your pulse time? Um, sure. That would be just for, for flame effects or any solenoids, anything like that, that would require that electricity be fired for more than the tenth of a second or the two seconds. Yeah, obviously it's a lot of time, but there, there may be applications for that, even if you don't use it. Jeff asking about um, firing time on a module. So the reason why it was said earlier not to fire things that fast on a module is in case a queue is shorted and you try to fire another queue directly after that, meaning let's say you had 10 cues each firing at a hundredth of a second, therefore 10 cues fires in a tenth of a second. Since Q1 is firing for a tenth of a second, if Q1 is shorted, Q2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, all the way to 10 would have a chance of not firing because the first queue was shorted. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's kind of, yeah. Like when you when cues are overlapping and firing at the same time from the same power source, if one of them becomes shorted, it's immediately going to stop any other cues that are firing at the same time. Yep. Nope. Uh, anonymous attendee says, are you guys thinking of doing a side exit connector kit for the ETM to be able to run off a slot board? I'm not a fan of the losing the top six. Uh, so yes, although it's, it's quite a tricky endeavor to do that. That's been a common request. You don't actually lose the six cues on the top of the ETM. It just gets replaced with this little mini connector. Um, I do believe we're creating a quick plug version of that third bay that combines with that BD20, DB25, but you don't lose it. You don't lose all 18 cues on the top. You just, um, it's just a pain in the butt to connect those last six. And I, and I do agree that the side exit connector in the ATM would make sense. Uh, Greg is asking half of my modules are a hardware. What am I missing out? Uh, currently just the, the firing speed rate, the one one hundredth versus the one tenth of a second. Yeah, that's yeah, correct. And as firmware versions go up, there may be some additional features that are missed out on hardware A, mainly just due to code space on the hardware A being an older module, we can't fit some of that stuff in there, but they'll always be compatible within their core features within future firmware releases.
did I hear earlier that someone, something new was going to be made available for the fourth for MGG? I, I think he's referring to the T locks. Yeah, T locks. Ah, T locks. Yeah. Go to Spirit of 76's website, right? Is that where they talk a bit about T locks? Yeah. Okay. They basically just have a little like nub on the shroud that like twists into the bottom of like a comet or a mine and locks in. It's just really fast installation. Yeah. T locks, not T box. So I think, guys, uh, do you want to, let's do this. Should we, you guys want to kind of, we'll continue on our, into our second round of Q&A right now, if that makes sense. Yep. Okay, so if, everyone, thank you so much for attending. I really appreciate, uh, we're going to still hang out, do some Q&A, but don't feel as if you have to hang out for that. We will be posting this directly to YouTube, um, so you'll be able to check this out later. Um, and thank you all the panelists. Uh, you know, Joel, Jonah, Ryan, Zach, and, uh, and everyone who attended. So we really appreciate it. Uh, we're going to continue to do these things. Uh, hopefully you guys have fun. We try to make it casual and interesting. So keep hanging out with us. We'll hang out with you. And thanks again for, for attending. And we're just going to keep hanging out.